We must abolish ICE. We need to call for the abolishment of ICE. I think ICE should be abolished. The Socialist Equality Party demands the abolition of ICE and defends the right of workers to live in any country of their choosing with full citizenship rights. We should protect families that need our help, and that is not what ICE is doing today, and that's why I believe you should get rid of it. What would you replace it with? Nothing. No borders. No borders. If that criticism of ICE makes you sad, here's a proposal. Let's shut it the fuck down. I'm serious. It's awful. And we don't actually need it. No borders. Abolish ICE, abolish CBP, and abolish any other agency that is engaged in this brutal war against immigrants. First, we need to agree that ICE is a problem. ICE is a problem. ICE is a problem. You want open borders, correct? Yes. And I support abolishing ICE. No borders, no nations. No borders, no nations. I, uh, I don't believe in borders. I think they all need to, all, all borders need to be done with, so. The demographic changes of our state are inevitable, and you are becoming a minority. In the last month, the American mainstream media sparked a debate about the Trump administration and their treatment of uh, immigrant children at the United States border. And I show you a little bit of it, but there's far more propaganda pictures like this going up on the Twitter. Uh, the Young Turks making segments calling uh, America's border policy to be like uh, Nazi Germany. Um, it's even gotten into my country here in Europe. Uh, America is pointed out at being the black sheep, the the example of not to follow. And uh, we also have actors and filmmakers, the intellectual artillery, the wise men of our society, uh, posting stuff like this. Jim Carrey also weighed in uh, with the funny comic, which uh, is inspired by the picture from Time magazine. So uh, Time Magazine posted this and uh, it was also used in order to uh, gather money for, um, I guess, reunite families. Money that uh, could have been spent to build a wall so that uh, families don't get separated anymore. Because you see, this is the predicament, like they're trying to travel the desert in order to... Uh, and this is actually the problem. As we look into what actually happened, uh, the Washington Post uh, writes a detailed article about this story. Apparently, the child in the picture was not separated. Uh, her mother was actually close by. And the mother also explains why she was crying. And uh, that's because she was tired and thirsty. Uh, the mother was not separated from her child. She was actually placed in a detention center along with her kid. And now the entire family is reunited. Uh, also interesting to point out that uh, the mother was not a poor person. She paid $6,000 to a coyote or a people smuggler to smuggle them across the border. Now, I consider myself to be a person of a little bit about average wealth. Definitely not poor. I would never consider myself to be a poor person. However, never in my life have I ever held six grand in my hand. This never happened. And I don't think it will ever will. So it's very difficult to explain to an Eastern European that a person who can afford $6,000 to a people smuggler is a poor individual fleeing from poverty. The same way that I can stay in my country right now without having access to six grand, I think that woman could have stayed in Mexico with the money that she was having. But that's just my assessment, right? Uh, I, I guess I'm not getting the message. The message is that Donald Trump is a piece of shit. His policies that are taking place uh, at the border are similar to Nazi Germany. And if uh, Americans don't do something about it, the entire United States can become eventually Nazi Germany. And uh, that people need to abolish ICE, which are the people patrolling and enforcing the border. And there is no underlying agenda here. Okay, This, this is not about politics. This is about humanity. You need to care. You need to feel compassion. Because uh, this is not political. There is no debate to be had. There is only one correct approach to this. Um, luckily, we have the internet. And uh, we can see if there is an underlying agenda to this or not. Our message absolutely is don't send your children unaccompanied 
uh, on trains or through, uh, through a bunch of smugglers, we don't even know how many of these kids don't make it and may have been waylaid into sex trafficking or killed because they fell off a train. We have no way of tracking that. If they do make it, they'll get sent back. More importantly, they may, may not make it. Now, this isn't new at all, and it's not about ICE. The No Borders, No Nations communist chant has been around for a very long while. Huh. Isn't that interesting? That was just a couple of years ago. If Donald Trump would say this now, he would be considered a bigot. He would be considered racist. And it's not only that. But why weren't the media upset when this was taking place? Where was the outrage? Where, where were the people chanting in the streets? All of a sudden, it seems that maybe the concern of children isn't the purpose here. And the purpose is absolutely political. is to sabotage the political opponents by using emotional manipulation in order to get something that you can't do by just having rational and logical discourse. But I think there is even more to this story. It's not just political. It's also people who are pushing an ideology that are trying to profiteer from this chaos. These people are anarcho-communists. And as the name suggests, anarchism means that there shouldn't be a state. And just like you can't have a house without walls, you can't have a state without borders. This ideology, as far as I could trace it, starts from this book, No Border, No Nations, No Deportations, written by activist and feminist Marxist university professor, Dr. Pam Aldred. And as we read this absolutely brilliant piece of writing, uh, which was published in 2003, we notice that it's a call for people to do activism in order to destroy the nation state. The No Borders Activist is a movement that joins an anti-racist agenda with an anti-capitalist one. Because, of course, owning property is horrible. Because the people who own property are privileged. The people who don't own property are oppressed. And thus, people can't own property responsibly. Luckily, we have the state. And if the state were to be encroaching into every aspect of a person's life, it would then understand what that particular person really wants to do with his property. And then the person doesn't have to worry because they will not own anything. The state will own everything. And of course, after a couple of uh, centuries, the state will educate the people into working as hard as they possibly can when they are at work, even though they're not getting paid anything. And when they enter a store with every product imaginable, they will only take what they need. And once the, everyone in the country learns this, then the overarching government can step down and finally we can have the communist utopia. Absolutely brilliant. Uh, you, you need to read this, by the way. Seriously, just if you have time, go on Google and read this shit. What I described is what communists truly believe. Eh? The process with the overarching government is socialism. And that, that is going to be like the massive government that's going to make sure that every nation in the world is being eroded and destroyed to the point that there will be a single world government. And uh, they don't call this imperialism, by the way. They call it anti-capitalism, anti-racism, uh, anti-imperialist, right? Because once the, you will have only one government and everyone is going to live on planet Earth with no borders and uh, no uh, uh, racist ICE patrols, right? Uh, then the government is going to educate the people on uh, how to be good communists and only take what they need and only work as hard as possible, uh, not, not be lazy, right? Just contribute like, like ants in a little anthill. And after it manages to do this, after every single person on planet Earth gets the memo and, and they understand how to act, then, of course, the government, who is now the only authority on planet Earth, will just step down. They, they will absolutely relinquish the power because that's, that's what people who have power do. They just relinquish it. And we will have Star Trek. We will have the, the communist utopia where everyone is equal, where there is no more classes between people. And it's going to be paradise. Uh, this madness is called communism. Uh, people are willing to do bad shit in order to accomplish this madness. 
this madness is now being taught in universities uh, in the European Union and the United States. And this madness was initially presented as a class struggle. It was the uh, proletariat, the working class, fighting against the bourgeoisie. And once people saw that capitalism creates a better environment that's more wealthy than communism, uh, and communism isn't really catching on in the West, they decided to change the ideology a little bit. They, they tried to, to put it in a different perspective so that they can achieve the same end goal, uh, but through different means. So instead of the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, now it's the oppressors and the oppressed. It's uh, white people versus people of color. Uh, white people versus the world. It's uh, men versus women. The oppressing Christianity religion versus atheism. Uh, transgenders versus cis people, so on and so forth. Um, and the purpose of it is to destroy important pillars of a nation state, that of borders, that of police, that of uh, the family unit, uh, that of the people caring anything about the traditions of the nation they're in, about people caring about the culture of the nation that they're in. And this whole new movement, this whole new ideology that has the same end goal as communism, but is tackling a different perspective on it, is called intersectional feminism. And this is being taught at pretty much every uh, university within the West uh, when it comes to humanities. Now, if you're really interested in reading more about this ideology, and I do encourage people to read more because uh, if you want to be able to have a discussion with these people, you need to understand the fundamental basics, the pillar stone of their ideology. I suggest that you also read Open Borders, The Case Against Immigration Controls by Teresa Hayter, which is published uh, in the same year as the previous paper that I have been talking about. Now, as more and more Marxist professors in universities push this war cry uh, against the nation state, especially those of Europe and the United States, saying that they are racist, they are oppressive, they are systems that have to go, uh, more and more students became activists. Uh, and all of this became even more popularized when a punk band released uh, in one of their albums called Death of a Nation, uh, the song called No Borders, No Nation. So, as you can see, these are not people who just happen to care about children and nothing else. That there is no political message behind this. Because if they really cared about children, you would see them raising millions of dollars to donate to children homes. Uh, you would see them raise alarms when Canada passes a law that would allow the government in certain conditions to remove children from their parents if the parent disagrees with LGBT issues. Uh, no, this is simply about students who grew up with this ideology in the university, they got indoctrinated, and they became journalists, they became bloggers, they became activists, and some of them became politicians. If you want me to further support this claim, why is it that the exact same chant you get to hear in the United States, you also hear it in the European Union? or nations like New Zealand, which don't have the border problems that the United States have. And yet, here we have the exact same chant, the exact same demand of borders being destroyed. No borders, no nation! Stop deportation! No borders, no nation! Stop deportation! So as you can see, there is no conspiracy. There are no people talking in the shadows. All of this is out in the open. But in order to finally connect the dots, we need to look at history. After the Cold War, people realized how bad communism truly was. The stories coming out from the people living behind the Iron Curtain were of such unbelievable brutality that it made many Westerners aghast. Not only did the communism not provide what it promised, it did the opposite. It created famines. It created stagnation. Meanwhile, capitalist nations were flourishing. 
And because of that, communism got a really bad name. People wanted to dis disassociate from it. So the ideologues that still wanted to achieve the communist utopia, they tried changing the names. They tried changing the game. And thus they invented cultural Marxism. A thing which many leftists will tell you it's a conspiracy theory, yet there is nothing to conspire. There aren't people behind closed doors. There are academic papers published by renowned university professors at the Frankfurt School. One of the most influential critical theorists and an original member of the Frankfurt School was Herbert Marcuse. A cursory glance at any paragraph written by Marcuse will set alarm bells ringing for anyone even remotely familiar with the current culture of intolerance on college and university campuses. Consider the following passage from his 1965 essay, Repressive Tolerance. The small and powerless minorities which struggle against the false consciousness and its beneficiaries must be helped. Their continued existence is more important than the preservation of abused rights and liberties, which grant constitutional powers to those who oppress these minorities. Social justice, feminism, neo-progressivism, and post-colonialism, to name but a few, are all movements inspired by, or born out of, critical theory, and thus all come under the umbrella of cultural Marxism. Be it gender, sexual orientation, family, race, culture or religion, every aspect of a person's identity is to be questioned, every norm or standard in society challenged, and ideally altered in order to benefit supposedly oppressed groups. Classical Marxism saw class conflict as occurring between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, between the haves and the have-nots. Cultural Marxism views such a conflict as existing between the oppressed and the oppressors, between those with privilege and those without it. The working class has been replaced by minorities. Majority groups are typically defined as privileged and oppressive, with minority groups accordingly labelled underprivileged and oppressed. Heterosexuals are oppressive. Cisgender people are oppressive. Whites are oppressive, especially white men. Christians are oppressive. Those that do not fit into these groups are thus considered oppressed. It stands to reason, therefore, that if heterosexuals are oppressors, the solution is to encourage other forms of sexuality. If whites are oppressors, the solution is racial diversity. If cisgender people are oppressors, the solution is to encourage transgenderism. If Christians are oppressors, the solution is to propagate Islam. Theodore Adorno, another original member of the Frankfurt School, wrote a book entitled The Authoritarian Personality, in which he defines parenthood, pride in one's family, Christianity, adherence to traditional gender roles and attitudes towards sex, and the love of one's own country as pathological phenomena. This tendency to pathologize opinions and life patterns, which are not in accordance with its own political ends, is characteristic of cultural Marxism. Differing views are thus described as irrational fears or phobias. For example, a person who feels uncomfortable living as a minority in an area dominated by Muslim migrants may be decried as an Islamophobe, since wishing to live amongst those culturally and ethnically similar to oneself is considered sick and phobic. When Pakistani Muslims living in Britain, by contrast, show in-group preference, converting entire sections of a town or city into a mini Pakistan, there is no sickness, no phobia, only multiculturalism. 20 years ago, there were no Pakis here, no one was doing nothing. But now, the Pakis are in a stamp, man, trust, you know what I mean? Now, think 20 years ahead, boy, Fuck knows, man. This is going to be Pakistan. Or oh, England. It's going to be Pakistan, man. They're all fucking shipping over. So, as I was saying, uh, the idea of cultural Marxism was uh, quickly recognized by people who lived through the Cold War as just being communism in disguise. Uh, and they immediately started to uh, voice complaints about it. And the people on the left and the university professors at the time accused the right-wingers of trying to push a paranoid conspiracy theory. 
that these ideas are just purely hypothetical and that they will never come to pass. However, they did change the name from cultural Marxism to intersectional feminism, to social justice, to white studies, so on and so forth, uh, to the point where the people who grow up today and they haven't encountered communism, they, they haven't heard anything about it, uh, they sound good ideas, just like they sounded for the revolutionaries that brought communism upon the USSR at the time. Uh, but it's important to understand that this is not about racism. Uh, this is not about stopping uh, the oppression of people. This is not about uh, doing it kindness. This is just about the rich getting richer. This is about getting very cheap labor to make the iPhones cheaper. So as this guy is pointing out, is for the rich to afford cheaper housekeepers, to afford cheaper nannies, and to afford cheaper landscapers. Because think about it. If you have a person that goes into a nation, and he's got no connections there, he probably doesn't speak the English language either, uh, and he is willing to work for very little. If he is placed to work 12 hours a day and work safeties aren't being respected, can that person really go to the police and complain? Or will he be deported? So therefore, it's just so that corporations and that wealthy people can hire very cheap labor force. Uh, and this is why you will see corporations who would have everything to lose from communism promote this ideology. Because for them, it's, it's profitable. It's very profitable to employ uh, very cheap labor. And maybe this is even good for the economy of the nation as a whole, but it's not good for the working class who are being pushed away further and further from uh, employment and their concerns are not heard and they're being shut up with political correctness. And they're the ones that are actually suffering, which is why you get to see constantly throughout the uh, Western nation, right-wing parties keep winning elections because the working class, which obviously is the majority of people who are the ones who have been abandoned, they're finally voicing their concerns and they're finally going to vote and they're not voting against this. And, and maybe they don't know why this is bad for them. They don't grasp the ideology behind it and they don't really know what's uh, going on. But they can see that what is going on is affecting them. And because of that, uh, they are opposing it. And now you also get to understand why journalists who embrace social justice constantly attacks the police, constantly attacks the military, constantly attacks the idea of borders, constantly attacks the idea of people defending the borders, constantly attack human rights like freedom of speech, freedom of association, freedom of expression. The reason they are doing this is because these pillars stand in their way of the end goal utopia that they want to bring forth. And if we want to stop them, we have to defend these pillars because if they're attacking them so viciously, us defending them stand in their goals of their political ambitions.